often much more robust. And it's much more robust than um, the shale itself because the mineral cement holds the shale together, making a really solid object compared to the shale. Now, the reason why concretions are a sort of oval or a locally deposited structure rather than a whole layer of carbonate is because they form around a nucleus. And many different things can be a nucleus. For example, a little bit of carbonate shell could be a spot where carbonate crystal growth happens more easily, or something like a decaying organism. As bacteria decay an organism, all the things they produce diffuse outward and create a local microenvironment highly conducive to carbonate mineral precipitation. So when you cut this completion, you see at the center is a nucleus. And this one, it's just a spot of really dense siderite. Then surrounding that is the body of the concretion itself. And if you zoom in on that, you would see something like the inset in the upper right corner. The inset is not from the Maison Creek, it's from some concretions that grew in a sandstone. So the large gray spots um, are sand grains that make up the sandstone. And then in between, you see that light gray cement that's a carbonate, a calcium carbonate, in this case cement, that just infilled the pore spaces and kind of filled them up, making the solid rock with the sedimentary grains embedded in it. And then in a lot of concretions, the outside is a weathered rim. So you see in this concretion, that red outer layer is just caused by weathering. Um, and that would happen quite a bit after the carbonate concretion growth and after fossilization. Now there's a little bit of a feedback loop when a decaying organism is the nucleus, because as the organism decays, it promotes concretion growth. But as the concretion infills the sediment porosity around the decaying organism, it prevents oxidants like oxygen and sulfate from diffusing into the decaying organism therefore inhibiting decay. So this is why it's quite common when you have concretions nucleated around a decaying organism, that organism is preserved throughout geologic time as an exceptional soft tissue fossil. And that's what happened at the Maison Creek where almost all of the fossils and especially all of the most exciting fossils are inside these concretions and not in the shale itself. So when you collect a concretion, it would look like the two objects on the left here, um, that are just like, like a solid stone. But when you break it open with a hammer or with freeze thawing, what you see inside are these beautiful fossils. On the top is a horseshoe crab, and on the bottom is a millipede. So that's one of the reasons why the Maison Creek is this incredibly famous fossil site, because it has this really good soft tissue preservation. But this concretionary preservation also really makes the fossils much easier to collect. So most of the actual outcrop exposures are along the Maison River. Um, and rivers in quotes here, because it is called a river by the local people who live in the area, but it basically dries up each summer. So it's kind of considered more of a creek, I think, to most people. And because the shale is so much softer and more friable than the concretions, the river weathers away the shale, just accumulating all the concretions on the river and the, the riverbed. And um, so this, you know, the, the concretion protects the fossils from weathering away and allows them to accumulate. So it's so easy to go there and collect thousands of concretions incredibly easily. And many of them have fossils in them. And the same thing happens at the mine spoil piles where the weathering is due to things like rain. And so again, the concretions just get concentrated and accumulated. So making the fossils very, very easy to collect. And then of course, because of that, there are many hundreds of thousands of Maison Creek fossils preserving an extremely diverse carboniferous fossil assemblage. So many of these fossils are on the left. And you see on the right, a sort of cartoony reconstruction of a very typical carboniferous ecosystem, a very stereotypical carboniferous ecosystem, let's say, really based on the Maison Creek and similar sites. But is that actually an accurate picture of what the Maison Creek ecosystem looked like? Well, let's find out by going a little bit deeper into the actual um, Maison Creek fossil site itself. And so I'll start by just giving an overview, a very broad overview of the Carboniferous world and how it differed from the world today, which alone is enough to give us some information about what the Maison Creek ecosystem looked like. So just to place you a little bit in time, the Maison Creek is late Carboniferous or Pennsylvanian in age, about 307 million years ago. And this alone is enough to tell us that this ecosystem was quite different than what we see today, because many of the dominant you know, animal and plant components of modern ecosystems had not yet evolved. 
So this is about 57 million years before the origin of teleost fish, about 77 million years before the earliest dinosaurs, who of course did not not just evolve, but went extinct in the intervening time. And also, of course, it's very long before the first birds. It's about 129 million years before the first mammals and about 177 million years before the first flowers or flowering plants. So although the ecosystem may be analogous in its ecosystem structure to modern ecosystems, um, it just had very different components to it. But it's not just the ecosystems that are different, but the entire world and the shape of the continents looked quite different in the Carboniferous than they do today. So of course, as we all know, the continents move through the actions of plate tectonics and have had very different configurations in the past compared to today. And in the Carboniferous, what's happening is the early stages of the formation of the supercontinent Pangaea, which is where the dinosaurs originated and spent a lot of their evolutionary history. And the shape of the continents and some other factors have a strong influence on global climate as well. So what we're seeing in the Carboniferous is a very strongly differentiated global climate that's very cold and glaciated on the poles, but quite warm and wet at the equator. And what's basically happening is over the poles, um, both the north and south over those glaciers, there's, a, there's sort of sitting high pressure systems that trap a band of precipitation right at the equator. So there's very little seasonality, at least during this glaciation, and there's just constant extensive precipitation at the equator. So because of this, because of this warm, humid climate at the equator with lots of precipitation, we have the development of massive coal swamp forests along the equator. And if we go back to this map, you see the coal swamp forests right at the equator. They run across what is today North America and Europe. And these were dominated by things like ferns, tree ferns, seed ferns, horse tail trees, tree-like lycophytes and swamp gymnosperms. And I'll go over each of these plant groups with some pictures later. And if you plot the Maison Creek on this map, you can see it falls basically right on the equator. So right on these sort of coal swamp ecosystem areas. And you also see that it's right on the boundary between land and sea. So all those light blue areas are shallow epiric seas, which are seas that sit over a continent. And again, they tend to be quite warm and quite shallow. So the Maison Creek we already know is pretty much in a transitional environment, really quite near the shoreline. And if we look at how, where it sits in time in terms of the sea and the coal swamps, you can see it's right on the boundary between the Moscovian and the Kazimovian stages, which is right during a time of large scale marine transgression. Um, so transitioning basically from a coal swamp to a shallow sea, because when the sea level rises, it covers up a lot of these very flat lowland near shore areas, which are where the coal swamps actually grew. And the coal swamps are the black areas in these maps. So the question is, was the Maison Creek more like this traditional Carboniferous coal swamp, maybe transitioning a little bit into marine realm, or was it more like a typical Carboniferous marine ecosystem? And the answer, as we'll see, is that it was really truly transitional and that it probably occurred in a deltaic environment where there was input for the fossils from both the terrestrial environment and at least the brackish to somewhat marine environments. And it was transitional, not just in its location, but over the course of its development, you know, over time, it's recording this marine transgression. So to dig in a little bit deeper, specifically on the Maison Creek, rather than focusing on the Carboniferous world as a whole, we're gonna start by looking at the sedimentological evidence. So this is evidence from the rocks themselves, about the environments in which they were deposited. So the Maison Creek fossil site inside these concretions is held in this light gray shale called the Francis Creek Shale. And that's what's pictured here. So that's what you see in these spoil piles or in the outcrops itself is this Francis Creek Shale. So if we look at the stratigraphic column for the middle Pennsylvania rocks in Illinois, we start to see immediately that there's a really repeated sedimentary sequence. And these are called cyclothems. And you can see that here, those sort of yellow stippled regions are sandstone. The gray with lines in it is a light gray shale. The pure black is coal. The dark gray is a marine shale. And the blue blocky bits are marine limestone. And you can see, particularly by looking at the lines of the black coal and the repeated sandstone, 
that we have repeated sedimentary sequences in a very specific order um, that tells us it's recording a transgression and regression of the sea. And each of these cyclothem sequences covers about 100,000 years. And so what's basically happening is so that although the late Carboniferous is generally a glaciated time in Earth's history, we actually have um, glacial and interglacial cycles that correspond to variations in the Earth's orbit. These are called Milankovitch cycles. And based on the Earth's orbit, it gets more or less energy from the sun, meaning it's warmer or colder. And when the glaciers melt, you know, because there is a continent right on the South Pole, that ice was trapped on the continent and then is released back into the sea. So the sea level rises, but then when the Earth's orbit changes again and those glaciers form again, the sea level drops. And so that gives us this very characteristic repeated pattern of terrestrial to freshwater to marine sediments. And that box here is the strata relevant for the Maison Creek. And you notice the Francis Creek Shale is indicated there. So the Maison Creek is just part of one of this repeated cyclothem sequence. So to zoom in on this and actually see what these strata look like at the site, um, here's a picture of some of these strata. And in the upper corner, you still see that zoomed in picture of the stratigraphic column. So on the bottom, we have the Colchester Coal, which is itself fossiliferous, but does not hold the Maison Creek fossils. But it contains coal balls that are very similar to concretions that have lots of plant fossils, and then some plant fossils just in the coal itself. Above that, which means it was deposited after the coal, we have the Francis Creek Shale itself, which contains the concretions and the Maison Creek fossils. Now the Francis Creek Shale is up to 25 meters thick at its thickest point, but the concretions are only found in the lower three to eight meters. And then at most outcrops of the Maison Creek, above the shale, you see sandstone, but remember from the strat column, the sandstone is not laterally very continuous. It's just in these local areas. So it tells us a little bit about what's going on in that area, but not so much about sort of large scale environments. So we'll talk first about the Colchester coal. So this tells us what was living at the Maison Creek shortly before the fossils were deposited, which means it's still probably close by even when the fossils are deposited. It just had to move away from the sea level rise. So coal is only formed in a very specific environment, and that is called a coal swamp environment. So coal swamps form in very warm, very humid environments with lots of precipitation. Uh, they tend to be very flat, very low-lying, poorly drained areas. So it's a lot of stagnant water, no sediment deposition, and a lot of plant material is falling into this water and it just overwhelms the decay capabilities of the system. So things don't decay, they just build up as all this organic material called peat. And once the peat is subjected to heat and pressure over time and dewaters, it eventually forms into lignite and coal. So the fact that we have this coal underlying the Francis Creek Shale, we know that before the Maison Creek fossil site itself and the fossils themselves were deposited, there was a peat swamp forest or a coal swamp forest in that location. And peat swamp and coal swamp are kind of used interchangeably by people. Now, that tells us, of course, that moving into the shale, we had to have a change in the environment. And as it turns out, it's very common to have shale associated with coal, and it also tells us a fairly specific depositional environment signal. Oh, and this, by the way, is just a general view of what a coal swamp would look like. Again, just another picture from me of a carboniferous coal swamp. Yes, moving on to the shale, which again gives us a more specific fairly specific signal of what's happening when we have shale associated with coal. So basically, shale has to be deposited by the movement of water bringing sediment with it. So it carries things like mud or silt. They get deposited in a layer that later turns into shale, just like the way peat turns into coal over geologic time. So sediments are very commonly deposited in coal swamps during flooding events. And Often what happens is this flood happens, it drowns the coal swamp vegetation. So temporarily there's no coal swamp there, there's just shale being deposited. But then for whatever reason, the flood quickly goes away, the coal swamp can then can grow back again. Um, and this leads to just very thin shale parting layers between coal. So the picture here is not from the Maison Creek, but it's from a similarly aged coal in Kentucky. And so you see the coal, is interbedded with layers of shale partings, as they're called. And each of these shales is just very thin, 
you know, a few centimeters to a few tens of centimeters. So these might even have been like local river flooding events. Uh, but of course, the 25 meters of the Francis Creek Shale is probably quite similar in, in general function for what happened, um, but at a much larger scale. So the Francis Creek Shale also represents an event that floods this coal swamp, but rather than being a small scale local flooding event, this probably corresponds to the rising sea levels and a marine transgression. Um, the transgression recorded in these maps here, and specifically one of the many transgressions and regressions that are recorded in these um, carboniferous cyclothems. So this drowns the coal swamp and replaces it with a shallow sea. So then all the rivers that are coming to the coal swamp can start depositing their sediments in this shallow sea, leading to this large delta plume that became the Francis Creek Shale. And typically when you have this type of light gray shale, that would be a non-marine shale, and this means that even though it's being deposited right offshore in a marine environment, um, it's, bring, it's the sediment that's being eroded from a terrestrial area. And there are other things as well that influence the Maison Creek. Uh, so for example, the moderately gray line, um, line in that map represents a mountain building event. So this uplifts a lot of land, so it gets eroded more easily, putting a bigger sediment load in the rivers. Also, um, a marine transgression corresponds to melting of the, of the ice at the pole. So this removes that high pressure system holding the precipitation belt over the equator, resulting in a more monsoonal climate. So it'll be wet sometime, but there's also a dry season. So there's less vegetation, also leading to more erosion. Um, so all of this contributes to the large sediment load that builds off the Francis Creek Shale. Now there really was a question, right, whether or not massive amounts of sediment that builds the Francis Creek Shale happens in one or more hugely cataclysmic events, or whether it was more consistent rapid sedimentation over longer periods. So still quite rapid sedimentation, but at a more constant rate. Well, if you do have a cataclysmic event, you would expect really episodic incursions of very high energy water, like periods of flash flooding. And you would expect to see high energy sedimentary structures so things like ripples, things like very, very non-flat sedimentary layers. In contrast, even if the sedimentation is very rapid, um, if it's fairly consistent, then you would not expect to see high energy sedimentary structures. And the interpretation here is that there's one or more large rivers that's just always moving sediments in. And if we look at the Francis Creek Shale, we typically see straight, relatively horizontal layers with few or any sedimentary structures. This indicates deposition into a calm environment. So lots of sediment is being moved, but it's just building up in a calm near shore marine environment. So it's not a major flooding event or a storm surge. There's also some evidence for a tidally influenced environment. And typically a big flash flood or storm surge would just completely swamp any evidence of tides. So again, this is evidence for a calm or depositional environment. And you can't see the tidal evidence in the outcrop like this because it's too weathered. But if you take pores of the Francis Creek Shale, you can see the tidal rhythm lights, which are these cyclic laminations of light and dark sediments. And what this is interpreted as showing a thicker ebb tide band and flood tide band, which again indicates rapid sedimentation because the ebb tide from the tide is going out to the sea. So when the rivers can continue bringing their sediment load into this environment. So again, the Francis Creek Shale is interpreted as river delta sedimentation. So the coal swab is not actually living in the environment where the shale is being deposited and the fossils are being formed. So the gray non-marine Francis Creek Shale is, is sort of a delta wedge sedimentation. You can see evidence for this also in the fact that it is thickest right where the paleo shoreline is interpreted to be, and it pinches out away from the paleo shoreline. Because again, these rivers bring a lot of sediment, but most of it is deposited right at the near shore part of the delta, and then there's less and less outwards. And the associated sandstone is also part of a typical delta sedimentary complex and may indicate a prograding delta because sand is heavier than mud or silt. So it gets deposited closer to shore, often in like a river channel rather than maybe in the body of the delta. Then other evidence for this is that as we go farther out from the, France, uh, from the paleo shoreline, the Francis Creek shale pinches out, but at the exact same age, there are marine black shales and marine limestones. 
So again, this indicates just this fully continuous environment from the sort of coal swamp, the near shore delta to the purely marine limestones. And I just want to note as an interesting comment that a lot of these marine shales also are exceptional fossil sites, uh, but they have a very different type of fossilization than the Maison Creek and a very different fauna. Um, and one thing that Mecca Shale, for example, has are, is a really diverse fauna of Carboniferous chondrichthians. So pictured here is a fossil of an Enneopterygian chondrichthian, which is in the red box in the reconstruction. It also shows a number of other of these weird cartilaginous fish that were living in the Carboniferous. Okay, so that's the basic environment. But what about the actual ecosystems, the habitats, the animals and plants that live there and that make up the fossil site? Because it, as it turns out, there's a lot of input into the fossil site um, from environments outside it, right? Like I said, that the coal swamp was not actually living in the fossilization environment, but of course there are lots of fossil plants at the Maison Creek. So they, there is somewhere nearby some kind of terrestrial environment. So we'll start by talking about the flora and then the fauna. Okay, so if we go back to our interpretation of the Maison Creek as a delta, we'll see that there, in terms of what animals and plants were living there, there are all sorts of sort of local microenvironments within this delta. And the flora pretty much entirely would come from the Colchester peat swamp. So remember that Maison Creek is deposited in a marine transgression, but this basically just pushes the coal swamp back a little bit. So it's still right on the paleo shoreline, but the paleo shoreline moves away a little bit from this exact area. Now, the other thing to note is that the fossilization area is in this red box. So the shale is being deposited and the concretions are growing really in the body of the delta itself, away from shore a little bit into a more marine or brackish environment. So all the plants in the Maison Creek that were living in this Colchester peat swamp all have to be transported to this fossilization environment which really obscures any local environmental differences in the peat swamp or the coal swamp. So if we look at the Maison Creek fossil flora, um, these data are from Wittry 2020, who based it on the Field Museum paleobotany collections. So there's almost 11,000 specimens, but this is of course biased in various ways as museum collections often are. But this gives us a picture of quite a diverse flora. So the most abundant group are the seed ferns, which make up 36.63%. An example of this is Macroneuropterus, where you see a leaf fossil and a reconstruction of the adult of the full living plant. So seed ferns are extinct. Uh, their foliage looks very similar to true ferns, which is why you notice there's the category down near the bottom, indeterminate ferns and seed ferns. Um, some fossils, we don't know whether they're true ferns or seed ferns. But the big difference between seed ferns and true ferns is that true ferns reproduce with spores and seed ferns reproduce with seeds. Uh, and seed ferns might be ancestral to or closely related to other seed plants, but it's still not fully known. And the seed ferns, there were probably some low growing group, but they also grew into trees like tree ferns about 10 meters tall. The next most abundant group is really dropping in abundance. But those are the horsetails, making up about 17.43% of the fossils. For example, annularia, which is pictured in the fossil on the far left. And these are, of course, related to living horsetails, um, Ecclesidum. And there were some forms in the Carboniferous that were similar for low growing, sort of herbaceous forms. But there also were quite large horsetail trees that grew up to 30 meters tall and had very tough woody stems. At a similar abundance are true ferns, you know, 15.83%, like this fossil fern pictured called Craniolopterus. And these are related to living ferns. They have a lot of the same groups and included both tree ferns and typical low growing ferns. Again, of similar abundance are the lycophytes, such as Lepidodendron. So today, lycophytes are only found as club mosses. So very small, very soft bodied, whatever plants. Uh, but back in the Carboniferous, these included massive trees, probably the largest trees in these coal swamp forests that grew to 25 or 50 meters tall, which is especially impressive because they did not have true wood. They just supported their height with very, very thick bark. Unlike modern club mosses, you can see very well in the photograph of a modern club moss, you know, they just have these little green projections growing out of the stem, 
And that's what these ancient lycophyte trees had as well. Instead of big, broad leaves, we might think of leaves, um, a lot of their branches and stem were just covered in little leaf projections. And then in the fossil, you see a very characteristic pattern of lycophyte bark. And this is a lepidodendron bark specifically. Then a real decrease in abundance would come to the coniferophytes, like the extinct swamp gymnosperm Cordites. So coniferophytes are extinct gymnosperms. They're possibly related to or ancestral to modern conifers. And Cordites was a really interesting plant, another large tree, sort of 30 meters or so tall. It had very long strap-like leaves and these adventitious roots that helped support it. So if we look at just the composition of the Maison Creek fossil flora, this gives us a picture of an extremely diverse whole swamp flora. However, remember, these are all transported in. So this jumbles together potentially all sorts of different local floral environments. And we do actually have a better source of evidence for what was living locally in the actual coal swamp. And that's the fossils in the Colchester coal swamp flora. And that actually looks very different in composition. So just based on particularly spore counts in coal balls, but also in other fossils in the coal and the coal balls, um, we see that the Colchester coal swamp was about 85% lycophytes, particularly tree-like forms, and about 10% horsetails, particularly small shrubby forms. And there are also complete trunks of lycophyte trees that are found growing out of the coal. This is again, not from Maison Creek, but from a very similar fossil site. So that sort of dark gray layer below the reddish layer is the coal. And you see right next to that yellow scale bar, which is one meter, a sort of void that is the shape of a tree trunk. And this is the trunk of a giant lycophyte tree. So it's rooted in the coal, telling you it was living there when the coal was deposited. And then when the flood came in, bringing all the shale. I can, I can eat and watch this at the same time. Oh, never mind. It's going to go on for an hour, you know. Well, um, I'll get the dinner ready. Then we'll see. And so, um, yeah, as these lycophyte trees were growing. Well, we ate with the TV on, so we should eat this on, too. And then it oh. left this mold of the tree trunk. Okay, so that's a... So if we see okay. a reconstruction of the full chest of full swamp flora, it's largely lycophyte trees with a little bit of these low-growing oh. horsetails. Church. This is actually very typical of Carboniferous coal swamp flora. It's thought that these lycophytes grew in the poorly drained peat coal forming areas to the near exclusion of all other plants. So in these actual coal swamps, the overall diversity of plant life was quite low. And the more diverse fossil flora was transported in from better drained non-peat forming lowland areas. So if we kind of summarize the Maison Creek fossil flora, we have this near shore Colchester coal swamp with a very low diversity of living flora, um, and then a much more diverse, more distal flora. And all of this was transported in with the same big rivers that brought all the sediment that deposited the Francis Creek Shale um, also brought in all these fossils. And plant parts tend to get transported quite effectively, so they're still extremely abundant in these fossils. Now, even these more distal environments are probably higher diversity than the near shore coal swamps. Um, but that also encompasses a number of local environments that might be more or less diverse. So if we look at a typical transect of sort of carboniferous flora, um, we see that the Maison Creek only includes a few of these different ecosystems. So we have the lycophyte peat substrate forests. We have a slightly more diverse plastic substrate forest that would still be very near shore that have ferns, seed ferns, and horsetails. And we also get a little bit of input from the marginal Cordites forest, those, those coniferophytes, that had a longer distance to be transported. So they're not very high abundance in the Maison Creek fossil flora, even though they did dominate certain forest environments. And then in the Maison Creek, we don't see any input or very minimal input from these occasionally dry vegetation, the seasonally dry vegetation, the seasonally wet vegetation, that are more distal upland areas. Okay, so that covers the flora, but what about the fauna? Well, the fauna is actually quite a bit more complicated than the flora um, because it covers more local environments and a lot of these things are more likely to have been living in place. So there's more local variation than in the flora. So the flora is all jumbled together by the transport. So it was very early on recognized that there are two main faunal assemblages, the Essex assemblage and the Braidwood assemblage. 
for the braidwood assemblage is the freshwater and terrestrial fauna and flora. Um, so this is where all the plants are as well, primarily. And maybe a little bit of some in situ fauna, so things that are living in a more fresh to brackish water. Um, but then compared to the Essex assemblage, which is more brackish or marine. Uh, so this is more, so the Essex assemblage is more geographically variable than the braidwood and probably includes a lot of benthic organisms in situ with some local variation and also some nectonic organisms in some areas. So it's the Essex fauna that was really most likely to be living in the Maison Creek environment. So because of that, we can actually see some local sort of more life assemblages of the Essex fauna assemblages. And we can also see the patterns of diversity really um, show us this picture of having terrestrial input at one spot leading into a more brackish or marine environment. So the two left, at least by my left, um, images here are the braidwood animals and the terrestrial plants. So you see their highest diversity is in the north, of this fossil collecting area. And then on the far right, the Essex fauna, the marine animals are most diverse at the southern side of the site. And you notice that the braidwood animals, the darkest spot of their highest diversity is just six plux taxa. And compared to both the plants and the Essex fauna, their darkest, most diverse spots correspond to 16 plus taxa. So these freshwater and terrestrial animals are generally speaking lower diversity than the plants or the more marine animals. Okay, so we'll first talk about the braidwood assemblage, which encompasses both terrestrial and freshwater animals. So coming back to our little ecosystem here, well, of course, the terrestrial animals also would come from the peat swamp. But then if we add some various freshwater environments or places where freshwater or fresh brackish water animals might have lived, we see a few more sub-environments. And of course, as you can see, most or all of these also involve fairly significant transportation into the fossilization environment. And this leads to the first most obvious comment about the grade of assemblage. It's 99% plant fossils and 1% animal fossils. And the reason for this is that plants survive transport much better than animal carcasses do. And they also fossilize better than animal carcasses. So they just get transported and fossilized in this assemblage at much higher rates than the animals do. Also, the plants might just be more abundant in these coal swamps. And the aquatic freshwater animals, which kind of is the only thing in the braid with that might have been living in situ, generally belong to groups that tolerate a wide range of salinities. So this includes some bivalves, some sin carrot shrimp, and some horseshoe crabs, all of which are much more likely to be you know, freshwater to brackish water rather than purely freshwater organisms. And these things that might have been living there are extremely low diversity. They're really dominated by these three taxa, the solomide bivalves, the sin carrot shrimp, and the horseshoe crabs. And so these are these, those three groups pictured here. There's the bivalve, the shrimp, and the horseshoe crab. And I will comment that this is one specific horseshoe crab, Eupropstanae, which is thought to have been potentially brackish water or freshwater or even semi-terrestrial. There's another horseshoe crab in the Maison Creek, Paleolimulus, that is more likely marine. So those are sort of the most likely aquatic animals that might have been living there, very low diversity, probably brackish water. Then we also have the terrestrial animals, which are much rarer than these aquatic animals, but much higher diversity actually. And these were dominated by terrestrial arthropods, so things like insects, arachnids, and myriapods. And so here we have some fossils, um, a few insects, one myriapod, and one scorpion. Now the Maison Creek is really interesting from an insect perspective because it's fairly close in age to the origin of flight in insects, making it fairly close in age to when we first start seeing abundant diverse insect fossils. So it includes some of the most primitive winged insects, the Paleodictyopteroidea, which are an extinct group of insects. They have the most primitive wings. As larvae, they have wings on every segment of their body, in fact. And as adults, a lot of them still retain three pairs of wings rather than the more typical two. In Maison Creek, we also see the sort of paleoopterous insects like dragonflies and mayflies and neopterous insects that can fold their wings over their back, like the cockroach pictured here on the left and the orthopteran, like grasshopper relative in the top middle. And cockroaches particularly were extremely diverse in the Carboniferous, and it's sometimes called the age of cockroaches. So the terrestrial invertebrates in the braidwood assemblage are really, really interesting 
if you're lucky enough to find them. And I think the insects are probably really well preserved and a bit more common than some other things, partially because they were probably more common in life, partially because they could fly out over the delta and maybe get transported through life a little bit, and also because insect wings fossilize quite well. Not much eats them and they're pretty robust. Okay, then we do also have vertebrates in the braid with assemblage. Uh, they're very uncommon, although there are large coprolites. They're a bit more common and coprolites fossil poop. So these are probably evidence of larger vertebrates living there that either did not fossilize or didn't die in this environment. And the amphibians here, which might be terrestrial and might be freshwater, are probably the rarest of all fossils. It's estimated you get one amphibian in every 100,000 mutations. And so here are a few of the braidwood vertebrates pictured. To the left is a shark egg case. Uh, in the middle, we have on top, Elenichthys, just a typical fish. Below that, a lungfish. At the bottom, a snake-like amphibian. The right, we have a more salamandry looking amphibian. And then at the bottom is the tooth of the xenocanth shark. So there is a fossilization bias in concretions, and that large animal is very rarely fossilized in concretions, especially in the Maison Creek. So we have very little evidence for the larger fauna in this area, but occasionally there's partial preservation like this tooth from a larger animal, indicating they might have been living there at least temporarily um, and just not fossilized very commonly. And then here's just a little reconstruction of the braidwood assemblage. But be aware, of course, that probably just like the flora, this is kind of a mixed assemblage. There's some things being transported in from the terrestrial environment, and not much of this was likely living in situ together in one kind of first looking ecosystem like this. But it still gives a good picture of the things that make up the braidwood assemblage. So the braidwood assemblage, there's probably a low, sort of like the flora, there's a low diversity living fauna that lives quite nearby in the practice to fresh water, which is much more commonly transported to the fossilization environment. And then with harder transport, are the terrestrial things or the purely freshwater things that live farther away and have to be transported over longer distances. So this results in the diverse fossil braidwood fauna that's very heavily dominated by a few freshwater to brackish water taxa. Okay, so moving on to the Essex assemblage, which is even more complex than the braidwood. So the Essex assemblage is described sometimes as a marine assemblage. However, it looks very diff different than a typical offshore marine carboniferous ecosystem, because typically that's dominated by shelly fauna of things like calcareous algae, stony sponges and stony coral, articulate brachiopods, shelled cephalopods, and crinoids. And these things were probably very common in these environments, but also fossilized extremely well because they have hard shells. So, the fact that we basically don't see any of these in the Maison Creek Essex assemblage or anywhere in the Maison Creek indicates the Essex assemblage, although it's possible these things were living in near marine salinity, they probably represent a specialized nearshore marine or marine to brackish ecosystem that's just different than this offshore marine environment. So if we look at the Essex environments, the more marine to brackish, these things of everything are the ones that are most likely living in or very close to the fossilization environment. There's minimal transportation needed to bring them into this fossilization environment, which also allows us to understand better how this assemblage varied um, geographically. So within the acid assemblage, there are two integrating sub-assemblages, and these do not have names. In the north, there are primarily benthic invertebrates. And here's a reconstruction of that. So you see there are still some swimming organisms, but lots of things living on the seafloor and burrowing. There's far more evidence of infaunal activity in these more northern, northern areas. And then in the south, there's primarily pelagic taxa. So here we have a reconstruction of the southern component of the Essex assemblage. So lots of swimming things and just fewer benthic things. But of course, they both have combinations of all of these. Now, it's not entirely clear what environmental factors separate these two sub-assemblages. It has been argued that in the South, there might be very low benthic oxygen levels, leading to this dominance of a pelagic fauna. It's also been suggested that water circulation might influence this. If you remember from an early slide, we get the highest diversity of freshwater and terrestrial organisms in the North. So there might have been a freshwater plume towards the North 
preventing these more marine or pelagic organisms from living there. And then aside from these two integrating sub-assemblages, there are also smaller local variations in abundance. Now across all Essex assemblage localities, the most abundant taxon is Essexella ashray, or the blob, interpreted as a cnidarian medusa. So here's a fossil of Essexella ashray and the reconstruction, which reconstructed as a jellyfish with a little skirt around its tentacles. And this was probably very common in life, and also because of the exceptional fossilization there, and because it required very little transport, it's also commonly fossilized. However, depending on the sampling site, the next most common taxa varies. So all of these taxa are very common in general in the Essex. These are the Solomite clam, which is also very you know, closely related to the one in the Braidwood, the Eocarid shrimp, Bellotelus magister, and the Holothurian sea cucumber histrum, or trace fossils. So all of these are quite common, but locally um, one might be more common than the other. So they edge each other out for the second most abundant. And here are pictures of all of these. We have clam again in the upper right-hand corner, the big picture of the shrimp bellotelson, and then the smaller picture of the sea cucumber. You can very clearly see the ring of plates that makes up the middle. And then aside from that, there are also some local, very small scale areas, like acre-sized areas, that are dominated by a taxon that is otherwise rare. So the difference here is the tax listed here are almost, are almost unknown. They're very, very rarely found in the Essex assemblage, except in these local areas. And these include the Octomedusa jellyfish, Octomedusa picorum, the chitin glaucorochitin, the problematic Atacistus communis, so its phylum is not yet known, the lingulid brachiopod lingula, and the polychaete worm, a fan worm, Masoferusa prinosi. So again, pictured here on the left is the lingulate brachiopod, a kind of long skinny chitin next to that, polychaete fanworm that was living in some kind of tube. And on the far right on the top is the Octomedusa jellyfish and below that, the problematic Hedocystis. So now as with the braidwood, many of the acid spawn are always rare. They don't even have these local common accumulations. And vertebrates in particular, as in the braidwood, are quite rare in the Essex. But also in the braidwood, like having these interesting amphibians, other vertebrates can be very interesting in the Essex fauna. So one of my favorite fossils is the Tully monster, or Tully monster gigarium. So you can see a picture here of this very strange looking thing. It does have kind of a fish-shaped body and a fish-shaped tail fin, but also near the head, it has this really long, solid, robust eye bar, or eyes on stalks with an eye on each end, and the elongate anterior proboscis that bends in a few places and ends in the sort of bifurcate claw, sort of oral apparatus. And for a long time, almost 50 years, it was not known what the Tolly monster was. It was placed in all sorts of different phyla. And then in 2016, I and some other researchers um, in multiple groups did a really careful re-examination of the Tolly monster. I'm determined, based on my group, did a re-examination of the whole body morphology. Um, Clemens et al. looked at the structure of the eyes, and we both independently determined that it was likely a vertebrate, in particular a cyclostome grade vertebrate related to a lamprey, and with a reconstruction in the inset there. And this was further supported in 2020 when I did some chemical analyses of the Tolly monster and found that the chemistry of its tissues was really consistent with protein-based tissues and it had no evidence of chitin, making it very unlikely that it was a lot of invertebrate groups like mollusks or arthropods and so on. Now, of course, no matter what the Tolly monster is, it's a very, very weird example of it. So even if we now interpret it as a cyclostome grade vertebrate, like a lamprey, it's a very, very strange looking cyclostome, but it is not unique in being a strange looking cyclostome in the Maison Creek. So another interesting thing about the Maison Creek is it has very diverse cyclostome fauna. The Tolly monster makes one. Then there are two other lampreys or lamprey relatives, which are the top and middle of the big fossils there. There's Mayomyzon, which looks like a very typical lamprey. And there's Papiscius, which is reconstructed directly to the right. It has a very unusual set of like crushing plates set in a circle as its mouth part. Although some researchers do suggest Papiscius is just a juvenile Mayomyzon, the juvenile of the other lamprey. There are also two hagfish. At the very bottom of the main set of fossils is Mixinachila, 
um, which looks like a very typical hagfish with the tendrils on its mouth. But there's also in the upper right corner, gill pick fees. Also a hagfish, but with a very strange oral apparatus. It has a very long sort of esophagus or, or pharyngeal tube of some sort lined with muscle blocks and very sharp teeth. So right now this gives us five different cyclostomes, many with very strange feeding apparatuses. And there's at least one undescribed cyclostome in the Maison Creek. Looks very much like gill pick bees, that one pictured in the upper right, but it's quite a bit thinner and about four or five times as long. So a very snake-like looking cyclostome. And as far as I know, um, this is the most diverse or at least the most disparate cyclostome fauna anywhere in the fossil record for sure. Um, and possibly it, you know, as comp is compares favorably in terms of being more diverse and more disparate even to modern environments as well. But it's not really clear what was going on or why this was the case. And then finally, the other really interesting thing is that there are many examples of larval fish, sometimes with yolk sacs still attached, like the coelacanth, um, the upper left picture here. You see that big sort of, so you see all the bright white kind of outlines of skull, and then the big sort of beige circle is the yolk sac. There are also lots of juvenile fish, like the Bandranga shark with the long nose below the coelacanth. And there are lots of things like shark egg cases, as pictured to the right. So it's been suggested that the Maison Creek was a fish nursery. And some of these fish are interpreted to have come from the marine realm into the brackish realm to lay their eggs or raise their babies. And some are actually interpreted as coming from the freshwater into the more brackish region to lay their eggs. And that, for example, would be Bandringa. Um, that juvenile shark pictured here with the long nose. Adults of that are only known from freshwater sediments, but um, these juvenile forms of Maison Creek are found in the more marine Essex assemblage. So to summarize the Essex, basically most of the Essex fauna are things that were actually living in the sort of marine brackish water fauna. So it's a very diverse living fauna that commonly fossilizes because it's already there in that environment. And there's also a very diverse living fauna in the offshore marine environment that is sometimes transported while alive to the fossilization setting, right? They come in there to reproduce. So some of the adults might die, leave some fossils behind, or their babies were then living in this more diverse marine brackish water fauna. So this leads to the very diverse and abundant Essex fossil fauna, which is largely not transported. So we see these local variations in abundance that tell us about you know, local microenvironment within the Essex fauna. And also, I forgot to mention this earlier, but the Essex fauna also has lots of plants. It's about 45% plants, as opposed to the 99% plants the braidwood fauna is. And this is, again, just due to the fact that plants are very easily transported. So they do get easily transported, even quite far out in this delta, into this Essex marine, more marine brackish environment. So, kind of summarize the Maison Creek as a whole. The fossilization setting itself is really just this one sort of near shore deltaic environment where massive rivers are moving through whole swamps from fairly distant from the shoreline to closer to the shoreline, bringing with them massive sediment loads and also lots of flora and fauna from these environments and depositing it in this delta. Once there, all these plants and animals but carcasses build up in the sediment and cause concretion nucleation, which then fossilizes them. But also, of course, not just things being transported, but lots of things were also living around the sort of brackish part of this delta, and some things were moving themselves in from the marine realm, resulting also in very diverse marine and brackish water faunas with some local variations in abundance. So the Maison Creek itself is a local fossilization setting, that gives us information about quite a wide range of Carboniferous environments. Okay, so most of this was not my research. So rather than an acknowledgement slide, I'm just gonna do a brief references slide to show you the major references I use when putting together this talk. So I suppose I'm really thanking all of these people for the great research they've done on this site. And thank you all for listening. I'm happy to take questions now. Um, John, could I turn on the lights? But thank you for your informative presentation. Our first question is, how often do you run into predetermined facts in your field that require re-examination? 
I think it's fairly common, you know, I mean, as it is in any science, I think, especially such, a, such an old field, you know, sometimes just advances in our understanding of the ancient world, advances in our understanding of paleontology, um, and technological advances lead us to really learn new things about old assumptions or, you know, what was thought to be the best answer 50 or 100 years ago um, might now be revised a little bit. So, and I think the Tolly monster is a good example of that, although maybe it's not perfect because, um, you know, we certainly have revisited that a lot recently, but there was no concrete answer about it, you know, in the old, from older times. Um, hi, my name is Patrick. Uh, my, my question was, how common is it for fossil beds and mining hotspots to cross over and exist in the same spot? I would say all in all, it's not that common, um, except in specific fossilization circumstances. There are many, many fossil sites that are really similar to the Maison Creek and that they're preserved, these sort of coal swamp environments or close to these coal swamp environments. So these would be similar ages, similar environments as the Maison Creek, where you do see the coal overlain by the exceptional fossils. However, that's really specific to that specific fossilization setting and a lot of types of fossilization on um, those environments that produce the fossils don't really overlap with mining environments. And then even with the Maison Creek, you know, the miners want the coal and the paleontologists want the shale that sits on top of it. So they're near each other, but it's not really a conflicting interest. Even the coal balls in the coal, you know, that actually breaks mining machinery. So they don't want those. Those also get tossed aside in the spoil piles. Um, so the paleontologists can get their fossils and the miners can get their coal with no, with no problems. Hi, Tori. Hey, Charlie. Yeah, this is Charlie Shabik, and I just want to say I'm proud of you. Thank Keep you. I'm so glad you could come. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm glad you appreciated you. the talk. You're really an expert on this. So. <laughs> I had a lot of fun with it. Great, great. And uh, I'm so pleased to see people still working on one of the most interesting times in the Midwest. Yeah, Thank you. I agree. Thanks. Hi, my name is CJ. Um, my question is, how do these fossilized soft tissues uh, help us understand the role that these organisms played in the Mason Creek environment during the Carboniferous period? Yeah, so there's all sorts of ways. I mean, one thing is just because we have these soft tissues, we have a much more complete picture of the ecosystem than we would with only hard tissues. And so we can start to piece together, you know, what things were predators, what were prey, what were burrowers, um, and really see how the ecosystem structure fits together. Also, of course, with the soft tissue morphology, that can just tell us more about what an individual organism was doing, how it could swim, for example, how it could ca catch its food, um, how it might escape. And then the final thing is actually, there's a lot of geochemical information preserved in these soft tissues. And this is particularly good in concretions. Fossils that are outside of concretions have less good sort of um, molecular preservation than fossils that are in concretions. And this is a very, very new field that we're just starting to look at. But things like isotope analyses or biomarker analyses of these tissues, I mean, we used it a little bit to look at the phylum of the Tolly monster, but they can also tell you what things are eating. For example, you know, are they eating plants or are they eating, you know, are they low on the trophic scale or higher on it? and so on. So the soft tissues really contain a lot of biological information that we're only just teasing apart. Hey, Dr. McCoy, uh, Andrew Sheff here. Uh, my question involves the interactions that a lot of scientists might have with uh, private stakeholders. Uh, could you give any examples of how th these interactions have gone between you and the stakeholders or your colleagues? Yeah, so you know, it's so I did a lot of my collecting on private land, so on farmland, and um, and that was great. You know, all the farmers actually knew a ton about the site, and they knew it, the best places to find fossils. They were all really skilled at cracking open the fossils. They all knew a ton about the plants and animals there. So I thought it was all really positive interactions there. Um, the Maison Creek is also really interesting because I think it was one of the best examples and one of the earliest examples in which you know, the traditional academic paleontologists really benefited from interactions with more amateur paleontologists, you know, people who were really, really expert, but maybe didn't have a PhD or something, 
So a lot of the collecting was originally done by these amateur paleontologists. And at any site, a lot of, there's a lot of collecting done by these amateur paleontologists. But the Maison Creek was one of the first times, and this was back in the 50s or so even, um, when the academic paleontologists, the Field Museum, really worked closely with the collectors and really acknowledged their expertise. So that, I thought the Maison Creek, I think is a great example of how that works. Now on the side of things like miners, for example, who own the mine spoil piles, um, this was a bit before my time, because by the time I was involved, the mine was pretty much closed down, as far as I know. Um, but I believe a lot of the early fossil collecting was by the miners, or specifically by the miners' wives. The miners would be digging up the coal, and their wives would be hitting the concretions to try and break them open. And they actually got the name bonking wenches, because they would bonk the concretions against each other, break them open, and get the fossils which were, I think, interesting just in general, but also could typically be sold because they're such great fossils. Hi, my name is Emma. And um, my question, when we were reading papers in preparation for this, um, it seems like a very, very, such a unique site. So my question was, um, in the context of other uh, fossil beds that have been discovered, how unique is this in, it, in its entirety, really? That's a slightly difficult question to answer. So there are many other fossil sites very similar to the Maison. Maybe I can quickly go back to the map of the Carboniferous world. Because you'll basically see that there's this very, very similar kind of continuous ecosystem all across the ancient equator um, that has these coal swamps right on, right on the paleo shoreline. So basically, or maybe the better one is here, you see, you see all those coal swamps right along the equator in North America and Europe. In those areas, there are many, many fossil sites that are very similar to the Maison Creek, preserved in concretions with very similar flora and faunas. And we also see, and they all preserve a fairly similar brackish water ecosystem. And we also see in different types of fossilization, the continuation of this sort of cohesive brackish water ecosystem um, continuing for maybe another 100 million years into the Triassic at least. So it seems like this type of ecosystem was probably quite continuous in space and time. And it is at least occasionally, you get these exceptional fossil sites that sort of pick it out and preserve it. But the Maison Creek is by far the most famous and has by far the most research done on it. So it does seem to be somewhat unique in how diverse it is and how abundant the fossils are. And certain things like the Tully monsters only found at the Maison Creek, not at any of these other sites. These diverse cyclostomes are only found at the Maison Creek, not at these other sites. These larval fish with yolk sacs, I'm not actually sure about, but I know they're, most, they're only sort of famously found at the Maison Creek. And it's not clear to me if the difference is that the ecosystem varied you know, across time and each fossil site is still a fairly faithful depiction of the ecosystem, or if some of the sites have been, have a slightly different fossilization process that maybe doesn't fossilize certain things as easily, or if for whatever reason, just luck, for example, the Maison Creek has been studied in much more detail and more extensive study of these other sites would reveal the same type, you know, an, an identical fossil assemblage. Got one more question for you. Uh, I was curious, can you see the reticulated pigmented epithelium of the tug monster with just your eyesight, or are you able to determine what that is exactly? You cannot see it with your naked eye. So basically, the RPE is a layered structure in the eye, and each layer has different pigments in it. And the pigments are held in melanosomes or pigment bodies, and the black eumelanin pigment is held in round melanosomes. And the redder pheomelanin pigment is in elongate oval melanosomes. And all that's preserved in this holy monster eye are these melanosomes. And you have to use a microscope, particularly an SEM, to see those. Um, but that is what you can see it once you have the microscope. And what we see then in the fossil is that these round microbodies and the elongate microbodies are in distinct regions in the eye. And this is interpreted as being you know, a flattened fossilized version of a layered structure where each type of pigment is restricted to a different layer. Um, so I think it's a very strong interpretation that this structure did exist in the Tully monster eye. But like everything in a fossil, there is a little step of, you know, 
the, those researchers had to take a little bit of an interpretive step to say that this flattened area with pigments in different regions was, you know, again, a fossilized, slightly altered version of this three-dimensional layered structure. Anyone who's not a student of the class can now ask questions. <laughs> I do have one quick question. Okay. Uh, regarding the coal that was found in this area that miners were digging up, was it more lignitic or was it more like anthracite? Depending, I'm curious about the environment and how it formed. So I, so I don't actually know. I believe it is more closer to lignite than anthracite. But you remember, that's not so much the environment in which it formed, but the environment that it was exposed to after the fact. However, if it underwent the really extreme pressure and heat and so on to produce anthracite, I would expect, you know, that would happen probably long after the Maison Creek itself was deposited. And I would think we would see much, you know, anthracite is more like metamorphic coal. So the rocks around it would probably not be so friable and soft and still so sedimentary looking. But that's not my area of expertise. So I would recommend, you know, if you want a definite sure. answer and look that up, but, but sure, I think sure. it would be more like lignite because I don't think the other rocks and fossils have undergone enough changes to get to anthracite in the coal. Sure, makes sense. That is our last question. And then we will end this Zoom session here. Thank you, Dr. Tori McCoy, for visiting with us and presenting your information. And thank you all.